And should the left, or should the left government support uh, the spread of democracy around the world? Um, if they're to be worth supporting, yes. Um, no government that doesn't support the spread of democracy around the world is worth supporting, is worthy of the title of left, and would get a vote from me. Um, simple as that, um, as a proposition. But why? And after all, uh, in a way, it's quite straightforward because we're here at a conference at which one of the great expressions of the conference is the absolute desire for democracy, to strengthen democracy in this country. Um, our democracy here is seen by many people as being inadequate. It's very, it's very democratic, but it's inadequate. We would like to deepen and strengthen that democracy. How could we conceivably think about doing that if we didn't have some sense about those parts of the world, large parts of the world, where even the most basic right to participate in your own society is utterly denied and the right to speak out is suppressed. How could we? How could we how could you how can you be on the left and not be an internationalist? Well actually from Claire I think I've heard how you could be on the left and not be an internationalist actually. You can be a pessimist. You can be so pessimistic about the chances of any outcome of anything that you do that you effectively allow, permit, support uh, maybe not even support, but it doesn't really matter, etc. All these kind of varieties of, uh, of anti-democracies which exist around the globe because of fear of what might happen if you didn't. Um, I'm interested in um, a kind of combination of things, uh, of arguments that have happened over the course of the last few years that may be a result of the pessimism brought on by 9-11. And very well expressed by kind of two trajectories. I read my own colleague Matthew Paris in the Times in an article about the limitations of democracy and why democracy might not be such a wonderful thing. Matthew was a former Conservative MP. And then in The Guardian, I read Eric Hobsbawm saying the West is wrong to think its institutions and values should be spread around the world. It doesn't say which institutions and values, but the institution and values I'm pretty sure he's talking about actually are democratic institutions and the values of the world democracy. Okay? Uh, I'm pretty sure about that. Now, in 1974, if you were to travel across Europe, you could have started down in the Algarve and ended up in the Urals. And the period that you'd have spent in a democratic country would have been a relatively brief interlude on all your way through right-wing dictatorships, through communist dictatorships of the Euros. That's not the situation now. So before we kind of dissolve ourselves into total pessimism, let us recognise that this is a continent on which Spain and Portugal are democracies, and so are the Czech Republic, so Slovakia, so in nascent ways are Romania, Bulgaria, so too in its own way now is Serbia, so too is Croatia, so too is Poland, so too is Lithuania, so too is Estonia, so too partially because of the campaigning work of the EU is the Ukraine, a big as Ukraine, which is a big gain to, to the people of Ukraine and so on. But the way in which we've heard it talked about today partially, you would have thought that none of those things were actually gains to the people in Poland. And that the work that had been done to kind of support those things were gains. Now, let's also go back to 1974. At that time, people on the right and the left had their own specific reasons for supporting their own dictatorships, as they did in places like the Middle East and so on. Uh, the right would say that countries like Spain and Franco and so on were a bulwark against communism, worse than the possible <laughs> alternative and so on, that they actually gave you models of traditional society which were embedded in the local cultures and local values of places like Spain, in the church, in the family and so on, and this was a fairly good reason. But what would follow the replacement of Franco might very well be a catastrophe. And you would have the mirror argument, because the left also loved its uncles. It loved its Stalin. It loved its Lenin. It loved its Khrushchev. Khrushchev was uh, going to, you know, was going to be the one who could kind of manage this tradition. It <coughs> loves still its Fidel and its loving its Hugo, despite the fact that he is now uh, fairly much bent on destroying the liberal democracy in Venezuela. Uh, and we can see a kind of thing that there's absolutely no mention of it at all. There's no mention of it whatsoever, and so you're not even supposed to think about it. But of course, and I. You know, in my own way as a youngster, kind of participated uh, in this kind of notion. And then you had, so you had, you know, the kind of left desire, and essentially left elitism. It was also represented where trade unions were. We wanted real democracy. Real democracy was what happened if you got 300 people putting their hands up 
but bourgeois democracy was what pe happened when people put their, their names on ballot papers and so on, and that wasn't as good. So 300 people doing what we wanted was a far better form of democracy than 20,000 people at a greater distance doing what they wanted to do. It was more proper, they'd heard the arguments and so on. And the right wing, in its, per, in its pessimism, also had its elitism in the same sort of way. It's embedded within their cultures. It's something that people understand. You've got to take account of local conditions and so on. Here's a fact. No two democracies have ever declared war on each other. Now, ponder why that might be the case. Ponder why it is that although it's not a sufficient condition, democracy is a necessary condition for social advance. The Chartists understood it, the suffragettes understood it, and so on. But some people here on the left today don't seem to understand this anymore. They don't understand that having some form of democratic government in Afghanistan is almost certainly a precondition to having the situation whereby women can actually have health care in Afghanistan, something they were denied before the intervention, and which led to a mortality amongst women which was simply remarkable, and which, amazingly, large people on the left, numbers of people on the left, don't care about. I do not understand this. I can't comprehend it. They don't care about it. So we, look at, so we now look at the question about the imposition of democracy, in the sense of the difficulties of the imposition of democracy. In January 2005, 8.4 million people voted in the Iraqi elections. 8.4 million. There aren't 8.4 million insurgents in Iraq. There are 840,000 insurgents in Iraq. There are probably aren't 84,000 insurgents in Iraq. A large majority of the people in Iraq, as far as we could tell, wanted the capacity to make the decision about their government themselves. The people who have stopped democracy being imposed by the Iraqi people themselves were the people with guns who prevented it from happening, yeah. so, for whatever reason, for, for whatever reason. And what is amazing is you can find people on the left who sign up alongside these people rather than alongside the people who have who are actually organising democratic elections in some way. Now, that doesn't mean that military intervention is your key answer to all known situations and so on. It isn't your answer to most of them. It most certainly isn't. In somewhere like Iran, again, which almost nobody on the left talks about, it's absolutely essential that the left supports and has solidarity with, as Sammy rightly says, but doesn't do, right, um, uh, with the uh, democratic forces and, and uh, democratic liberals and left forces in Iran. It's absolutely essential. The Iranian government has let it be known to academics that they are not to travel and they're not to have much to do with, uh, with, with Western. They're going to be under suspicion, much as the old so they did in the old Soviet Union and so on. Um, and at the same time, what do sections of the left do? They organize an academic boycott of Israel to enforce exactly the same situation on Israeli academics that the Iranian government, out of repression, is trying to impose upon Iranian academics and so on. So, one of the things that a left has to do in not in government is to express its solidarity for those movements seeking democratic change and reform in their own countries. And if we do not do that, if we are held back because we say somehow or other this doesn't, so it's, it's, it's somehow a kind of cultural, it's a form of, 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 of cultural imperialism to support democracy at all. How do you know what people want abroad if there is no democracy? How can they tell you what it is they want if they're not entitled to have a voice? How can anybody find out? Why would you assume that people wouldn't want to say in how things are run? Uh, and it's not enough just to say, Claire, national agency and so on. National agency can be expressed through a Hitler, it can be expressed through a Stalin, it can be expressed, it can be expressed, God alone knows, by uh, a Mobutu and so on. Only in a situation where people have a democratic choice can you know whether what is actually being expressed is what people want, which is why we, as a left, as a democratic left, not the undemocratic left, fought so hard for democracy, still fight for democracy here in Britain. And if we're right to do it here, we must, must, must be right to do it abroad.